Good morning. Well, barring an unexpected funeral, I guess this is going to be our last time together in worship. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be a bad thing. It's good that we are together once more in God's house. And after all, you're not here to see me or listen to me. You're here to hear God's word. And you're going to hear that today and you're going to hear it next week. And you're going to hear that until you hear God's word face to face. So, with that all being said, let's talk about our announcements for the day. Uh, later on at 1 o'clock, there will be a potluck uh, lunch for everybody in our church family. If you choose to come, you're asked to bring something that you would like to share with the rest of the congregation. There will be a pre-call meeting on Monday, October 28th at 6.30 p.m. President Finner and Pastor Clatt will be there uh, to guide you through the process of calling your next pastor. If you want to be on the call committee, uh, please let Randy know as soon as possible. There is still the no-bake bake sale going on, uh, and uh, that will go on until next Sunday. Uh, I thought there might be some extra aprons in the back, but I guess there aren't. Uh, if you want one, I guess check with Robin. She might know where they are. If you have any squash to donate for the fall supper, uh, you are asked to contact Sandy or Donna and let them know as soon as possible. And that's because the fall supper is coming up in just a few weeks. Uh, on November 13th, uh, from 5 to 6.30 p.m., the menu and the costs are all in your bulletin, so you can take a look at that. Uh, you can also bring in baskets for the silent auction. The baskets need to be here by Reformation Day, otherwise known as October 31st. The auction will begin November 13th. Third, uh, you will have 10 days to make your bids at that time on those baskets. And remember, all the proceeds from this will go to uh, the repairing of the roof. The community coat, winter coat closet, whatever it's called, there's a bin back there where there's a collection of different coats and other things in there. If you have an old coat or some new items or a monetary uh, donation you'd like to make, uh, you can contact Robin about the monetary uh, donation. Otherwise, you can put your other items in that overflowing bin back there. And then finally, we have Trunk or Treat coming up on October 31st. Uh, the location may be different, but we are hoping that we will still be able to have it. Uh, our parking lot may be taken up by a whole bunch of construction equipment at that time. If that's true, maybe we'll be able to use one side of the parking lot. And if that's not true, we might be able to use the, the uh, parking lot across the street. We're not really sure how that's going to work out because we don't know if we're going to have access to the parking lot or not. So um, we're going to have to be fluid with that, I guess. And if anyone is interested in taking over for Tracy, because she'll be gone after this trunk or treat, then you should probably let her know as soon as possible. Okay, those are the announcements that I have. There are others in your bulletin for you to take a look at as well. Uh, we take a moment now to stand and greet one another.
we make our beginning now by remembering our baptisms with these words. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore we are our fear. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and call upon him in prayer and praise, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church, in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The opening sentences for today are taken from Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your hands. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. We now sing the Kyrie to the tune of Amazing Grace. Let us pray. O oh God, without whose blessing we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and govern our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We now sing the hymn of praise, we give thee but thy own, hymn 781.
Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for today comes from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him. For this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. The New Testament reading comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering God's rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest. As he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, Again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, God. Please rise now for the reading of the gospel as we prepare for it by speaking responsibly the graduate. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and they made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. The gospel reading for today comes from the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. 
And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or lands, for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, hundreds, um, houses, and brothers, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated now. We sing our sermon hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory, hymn 850. <laughs> Jesus the Son, and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Around 300 BC, there was a famous Greek general named Pyrrhus. Later, he became the king of Greece. If you've ever wondered where the term Pyrrhic victory comes from, it comes from him. He used to win a lot of battles, but he also lost a lot of men doing it. That's why we still today call those victories Pyrrhic. When it feels like a loss it is not as great as a victory, in other words, the victory doesn't seem like it's worth the cost, that's called a Pyrrhic victory. Now one day after Pyrrhus had become king, someone asked him what he planned to do first. Pyrrhus said that he was going to conquer Rome. Then he was asked what he would do after that, and after that, and after that. And he continued to list all the different nations that he would conquer. And after all of those lands were listed, he was asked, and what will you do after that? 
And purists said, I will rest. I will relax and enjoy life. The one who was asking him those questions said, well, then why don't you do that now? What Pierce may have seemed like he wanted was conquest, but what he really wanted was rest. He just couldn't see it. That's why he got caught up in those various dreams of triumph and grandeur. That's why he kept on attacking other nations. And that's why he kept on losing many soldiers. Eventually, though, he was murdered. But it wasn't by an enemy soldier. He was killed by a woman up on a roof, throwing her tiles down from the roof onto him. One of them hit Pierce in the head, and he was knocked off his horse and paralyzed. In fact, it might have been that tile that killed him. So, rather than getting the rest that he wanted, he got the grave instead. Now, hopefully, you know that true rest comes only from the one who gives it to you as a gift. God rested on the seventh day of creation, and then he insisted that all of his people would do the same. And he intended that that Sabbath rest would be a gift. It wasn't supposed to be a day for people to sit back, put up their feet, and relax. It's a time to remember what God has done, and then respond by worshiping him. That's why you're here today, I assume. In today's Old Testament reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Solomon declared that true rest and true riches could only be received by God. They are his gift to us. And so he wrote, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. That's because the rich never have enough. Despite his accumulated wealth, the rich man has nothing to leave to his son. He can't sleep, and he eats in vexation and anger. And then he leaves this world exactly as he came into it, naked and penniless. And yet there are still many people today who seek wealth at the exclusion of everything else. And if they find it, it's possible they might, might find some measure of happiness. But they'll never know true joy. That's because happiness is different <clears throat> from joy. Although those people who pursue happiness may find it for a brief moment, it is fleeting. It doesn't last because it's based on the emotions of the moment. It doesn't last because it's based on feelings. Joy, on the other hand, is based on what God has done for us, whether good or bad. Now, ultimately, there are many prosperity preachers out there who are trying to convince you that you should strive for happiness. Joel Osteen, Oral Roberts, Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart, Joyce Meyer, Paula White, and all kinds of other prosperity preachers. They all want you to believe that God will bless you and reward you with earthly blessings if you wholly are devoted to Him. Those prosperity preachers take God's gifts and turn them into something people think they can earn. Those preachers praise the efforts of man. And by doing that, they rob people of the comfort that God intends for us to have in His Word. Gospel preachers, on the other hand, point people to Christ since he is the giver of all good gifts. And unlike what the prosperity preachers say, God hasn't promised earthly blessings to anyone. In fact, if anything, he has said that Christians should expect all kinds of pain and suffering because that's the cost of following Jesus. That's what it takes to pick up your cross and carry it for Christ. And yet, in the midst of your suffering, whatever it might be, you can and you should have joy. Because you know that whatever it is that you're going through, God will use it to bring glory to himself. And God's greatest gift to you is faith. When he gave that gift to you, he adopted you to be his own in the sacred waters of baptism. That's why we baptize infants, because faith is a gift. 
and it can be received by anyone, even infants. And when we've received that gift and been reminded of all the good and gracious things that God has done for us, we then respond by worshiping Him. Despite what the heretics of every age and place have tried to say, it's God's Word, the living and active double-edged sword that gives life to each and every person who believes it. Everyone is invited to hear about God's promises and to believe them and to receive what God has promised. But not many do. Some do. You guys gathered here today are proof of that. But most don't. Instead, they chase the wind and they toil in meaningless endeavors. Those folks, if you asked them what it would take to make them happy, they would almost always refer to something that hasn't happened yet. They'll say things like, if only I could, or when I do. And yet we know that even if they do achieve those things, it won't be enough. They will still want more. As Solomon wrote earlier in Ecclesiastes, their eyes can never see enough, nor can their ears ever hear enough. In fact, there's no amount of earthly good that will satisfy them. And Jesus said that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into the kingdom of heaven. That seemed like a strange thing to say, at least to the disciples. Because back then, wealth was considered to be a blessing from God, a way in which he uh, approved of his people. So when Jesus denounced worldly wealth, the disciples were not only amazed, but perplexed. So they asked Jesus, then who can be saved? And Jesus lovingly looked at them and said, with man, it is impossible but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, if anyone loves worldly things more than they love God, then there isn't much hope for them. Not unless they repent of that sin and put their trust in the Lord. But for those who do love the Lord, and more importantly, who know that He loves them, they have hope. They have life. And yes, they have joy. And no one will ever be able to take any of those gifts away from them because they are everlasting gifts. Now, wealth can be a blessing from God, and in some cases it is. When the rich use their gifts to be a blessing to others and to give thanks to God, it is a great gift from Him. On the other hand, if the rich use their wealth only to enrich themselves, then it becomes a terrible curse. But even then, they still won't give it up. Their riches were kept by their owner to his hurt and lost in a bad venture. Now it says many times in the book of Revelation that people will suffer in the end times and despite everything that those sinners will suffer, they will still refuse to repent. And so, so they will suffer and they will <coughs> die. When Jesus addressed his disciples in today's gospel reading, he called them his children. We often talk about God in a similar way, calling ourselves his children and calling him our Father. Now it's important to take note of the fact that in his small catechism, Luther has said, regarding the Lord's Prayer, that when we say our Father, it means that we're confessing that God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true Father and that we are his true children, so that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him, as dear children, ask their dear Father. Now, when Luther wrote those words, perhaps he had in mind what was written in today's New Testament reading from the book of Hebrews. The author of Hebrews wrote, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. So rather than asking for worldly wealth, which God knows we're going to spend on ourselves, instead we should ask God for wisdom discernment and a stronger faith so that we can always believe and cling to God's gracious promises. Solomon summed it up like this. 
everyone to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot in life and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. That's a pretty good summary of what it means to be blessed by God. Because he is the one who not only gives us his gifts, he also enables us to enjoy them. So whether it's food or drink or labor or even life itself, we will always be able to find joy in the things God has given us. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sadly, there have always been folks who look instead for get-rich-quick schemes. They pursue happiness rather than lasting joy. In the ancient world, like I said before, wealth was wrongly considered a sign of God's favor. Even now, in the modern era, many people still can't help themselves from craving riches. Back in the 1840s, Americans risked their lives to get across the country from east to west coast because they wanted to seek their fortunes in California. They wanted gold. And 50 years later, in the 1890s, other folks headed up to Alaska because they heard that there was gold up there, too. And many folks did find gold, but rarely did it bring them happiness. For example, there were some explorers many years after the 1890s who went up to Alaska and found gold miners there frozen to death in their hut. They were there because they had ignored the warning signs of winter coming because they wanted to keep on mining for gold. They got the gold. But when a blizzard hit, they were snowed in. Despite being surrounded by gold, it didn't save them. They were incredibly rich, and they were incredibly dead. That's how it is for sinners who pursue worldly wealth. On the other hand, those who seek God and his gifts will always find them everywhere they look. And then they'll have true and genuine joy. <laughs> Having inherited the gift of faith, you have inherited eternal life. Therefore, what Solomon wrote in chapter 9 applies to you as well. Go, eat your bread with joy, and drink your wine with a merry heart. For God has already approved what you do. And God will always approve of what you do, because when he looks at you, he sees Christ, his righteousness, and his holiness. Whenever your focus is on worldly things, you'll always get worldly rewards. And that may bring you some momentary happiness. But those things will never bring you joy. Because that's the gift that can only come from God when he gives you the rest that you need so that you can remember his blessings and worship him as he deserves. You should love God because he first loved you. And by believing that, you will receive eternal life. My dear friends in Christ, God has loved you, and he has blessed you with all kinds of gracious gifts. But the greatest gift of all is the faith which he's worked in you through his word. In that word, he has made Christ Jesus known to you and has made you aware of the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of your Savior. And those gifts are yours. And they always will be. Therefore, give God your thanks and your praise, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> On the third Sunday of each month, we sing a confession of faith set to the tune of immortal, invisible, God only wise. We make that confession now.
We now take the time to collect our offerings, and if you haven't already done it, to sign the fellowship pad. I'm sorry we don't have music to, to play during the offering, but we will have an offertory, if that helps. Let us now collect our offerings. As the offerings are brought forward, you're invited to rise and join together in singing the offertory from all that dwell below the skies, I think is the name of it, hymn 816. Gracious God, bless all who study at our schools, universities, and seminaries. Raise up more church workers, for the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Spare the servants of your church from the love of wealth, that they and all of us would gladly set aside every comfort for the sake of, of you and of your gospel. Heavenly Father, lead our households to find eternal rest in your Son and his word. Give fathers and mothers diligence in teaching their children, and preserve all of us from hardness of heart. Give us eager hearts to hear the gospel message of your salvation. Almighty God, guide our nation and its leaders in true wisdom to promote honest labor, temporal protection, and fitting enjoyment under the sun. Guide your Christians to serve Christ in their citizenship and callings. Do not let our hearts be occupied with the vanity of riches that perish, but with the true and lasting joy of Christ. When the righteous cry out, O Lord, you hear them, and you deliver them out of all their troubles. Draw near to the brokenhearted, the crushed in spirit, and the sick and those in need, especially Beth, Ruth, Rosemary, Madeline, Sheila, Diana, Gary, Dwayne, and Lois. Have mercy on them and give to them what you know they need, according to your gracious will. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the gift of eternal life that you pledged to us at our baptisms. Today, we especially want to give you thanks for those who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including Lisa, Christy, Colleen, Howard, Josh, Todd, Deacon, Justin, and Jada. Father God, guard and keep our brothers and sisters around the world who are enduring physical pain as martyrs and missionaries for the sake of your son's name. Renew their hope and their zeal, even in the midst of suffering, so that by faith they will be able to stand firm in your gospel promises and be steadfast witnesses to those around them. Work through these, your beloved children, to be Christ's light in a dark world. Finally, O Lord, since we have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, let us hold fast to our confession through all temptation and preserve us from sin, O Lord. Give your blessings to all who draw near to your throne of grace. We strive to do that now as we lift up all of these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you and keep you now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated now as we sing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace, hymn 744.